Oh, no, that's good. That's that's good. Ready that's good. Now. Okay. Okay. No, that's fine. I'll switch off my video and my camera. Yes, Hi, Dr. It was. Okay. Um, I'm live now, so I'm going to start letting people in. Okay, that's fine. Good evening, colleagues. Welcome once more to our webinars. And we about to start now. We're uh, five minutes late uh, before the presentation uh, that we are having this evening with Dr. Mapuroma, David Gekan. And thank you once more for joining us at this uh, weekly webinars uh, hosted by Clinics Health Group. And we're excited, uh, as we do every, every Thursday, to be with you. Uh, we're always looking forward to welcoming you and hosting these events. And I think thanks for the feedback that we're getting after the webinars and even during uh, the course of the week. And also thanks to those who are also responding to the, the surveys that we sent out every after the presentations. And this helps us to know exactly what, uh, what you expect from you and what you want to hear uh, from us and what uh, speakers we need to present. And uh, please note that these webinars are uh, CPD accredited and they are also uh, streamed live on YouTube uh, for your convenience so that um, at any time when you want to go back to view any of the presentations, you may do so at your leisure. And this one also will be uh, streamed live uh, on YouTube tonight. And also uh, this month being Youth Month, we are trying to want to profile um, uh, youthful doctors, specialists in their own fields who are working within our clinics, uh, health facilities. And um, so last week we had one of them, uh, Dr. William Tracy, who was at Butselong uh, and Pilweni. And this evening we're also excited to have one of our uh, uh, young doctors who's a specialist, and we want to pride ourselves in promoting black excellence uh, with the Clinics Health Group. And uh, next week, being Youth Day, the following day, we won't be having any webinar. Uh, so please bear that in mind. But also know that uh, you don't have to give us your information once you've registered because that information has been uploaded, will be uploaded uh, to the relevant uh, uh, regulatory bodies. And so this evening, we are excited to have um, Dr. David, my uh, former David Kagana, who is a newly qualified specialist surgeon with over 12 years experience as a medical doctor. Uh, David has worked mostly in academic hospitals where he managed different firms. He is a University of Pretoria alumni and Dr. Kagana is also a qualified pastor and presiding over uh, in this church in his grace and mercy ministries. 
He's a life coach and is very passionate about uh, life issues as they pertain to spirituality and philosophy. And Dr. Kikana's qualifications are as follows. He's got an MSHB um, from University of Pretoria, ATMS, and also College of Medicines a Fellowship uh, from the College of, of Surgeons. So we're excited to have Dr. Kikana speaking to us this evening on the management of erectile bleeding. So Muruti, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Muruti, Doctor, uh, welcome to this webinar as part of our, it's, it's based at Naledi Kanyezi Hospital that we didn't mention at the moment uh, within the Clinic Health Group Hospital. Thank you, Doc. Hi, Dr. Kekana. Um, sure, great, yeah. You can put on your video that they can see you, this young thank doctor. You. You um, so I was trying to unmute myself, but yeah, I was not allowed. But now I'm okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you very well. And just was, show I, I've you been trying to, but I think the host needs to allow me to do that to before. Kensley. I've been trying to unmute myself and switch on the camera. If they can allow me to show my video. Yeah, I, they can. I need permission yeah, to show my video. Kamu. Uh, Kamu, are you there to help Dr. Kikana? I need a permission to do that from the, the, the Zoom doesn't allow me to do that. So somebody must, uh, must. You have just asked you to start your video. Yeah, yeah there no, you it's, are. It's, it's not allowing me. I need. Oh yeah, there we go. No, we can see. We can see you. We can see you. We can see yeah. you. Thanks, Doc. There we go. I think it did. I think I'm. I'm happy with. Okay. It. Sure. Yeah. Um, good, good evening, you, you, yeah. okay, yeah, no, it's okay, thank you, um, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Bila, for the opportunity and all the organizers of this, like I was introduced, yeah, they're saying a young doctor, but my beard is white, you know, so, I, I, yeah, anyway, um, that was supposed to be a joke, um, thank you, um, let me greet everyone, um, who have joined in this call who's live um, uh, on this. Um, I really thank the opportunity and take the opportunity um, not light. Yes, I'm in Naledi Nkanyezi and um, then my profile has been shared. So let's hit right into it. The, let me do this so that I can just see my full screen. Oh no. Uh, can you see my presentation? Can you see my presentation? Yeah, okay. the presentation. You can switch off your video, it's fine. You can switch off your video, it's okay. Yeah. Um, sure. Can you see my presentation? Yes, definitely, we can see it. You can move it. It's not moving, eh? Anyway, let's see. Maybe yeah, it will come, move. Come. It will um, move, can we help the doctor you cannot to move the... Screen. Yeah, it's not moving. It's in one place. Let me do this. Let me let me start again. It's telling me. doesn't allow me to move it for myself. Can I? And I had moved it earlier. Yes. Let me start again sharing, and let's see. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm Please gonna connect. reshare again because um I don't know what just what is really happening. Okay, let me just do this. It's okay, I'll win. Okay. 
Yeah, Doc, I think you're winning, as you said. There it is. Good. Great. Men of faith. Can you see that? Yeah, we can see that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah. So, the, the overview, I'm going to keep this, I'm going to keep this discussion uh, not to, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't pick it up with what we do mostly um, as surgeon when we operate, but I am I am going to highlight to you um, broadly, and then from there with these that I'm go that I've listed the previews, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into it so that you know what to do when you have a patient um, that presents with rectal bleeding and when to worry and when to refer if you need to refer or when to investigate more. Um, let's head right into it. So before we go far, let's just revise a bit of anatomy of what we're gonna be talking about. So let's start on the, you, you, you will realize that the rectum itself and the anus, which is where my, my, my most of my focus of the talk will be, um, there is a different blood supply. Let's look at the, the arterial blood supply. We have inferior mesenteric artery, which is supplying the upper rectum. So the rectum is divided into three, the upper, middle, and the lower rectum. So the upper rectum is um, um, uh, getting a branch from mesenteric artery, which is a branch of the aorta directly. And the middle and the lower are supplied by the branch of internal. So there they are listed um, on the diagram. So let's look at the drainage as well. So the, the upper rectum and the middle rectum, um, the piece of a middle rectum drain into the portal venous system and the rest from the middle and lower drains into the caval system. And then we know that above the dentate line and below the dentate line, the innervation is completely different. And therefore also the um, um, lymph drainage is also different. So above the dentate line, we have autonomic and then below the dentate line, we have somatic innervation. So therefore when one has a lower or anal um, lesion or very low rectum, you can also have the inguinal lymph nodes that are palpable um, when you have a carcinoma of that region. Let's go through again. So you'll appreciate um, where the, 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 the bit of a zoomed in picture on the, the where the dentate line is and the skin and the squamous uh, mucosa. So most of our anal carcinomas, which would present as bleeding at some point or a lesion in the anus, would be squamous cell, majority of them, and the others would be melanoma and all those um, uh, uh, um, other uh, subtypes that, that one has. But mostly the rectum would then present with adenocarcinoma. And that's how you would then see if then you have any, um, in, in, case, in, in, in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the um, um, hemorrhoids piles that we're gonna be talking about, you will see that um, the one higher up would be painless, and then the one lower down will be painful when thrombosed because of the, the innervation. We, we said above the dentate line is, is, is autonomic, and below the dentate line, you, you have a somatic innervation. And there is a diagram illustrating the internal hemorrhoid and external hemorrhoid, which is one of the uh, causes of um, parectal bleeding. Okay, so let's see. So evaluation of erectile bleeding, um, a complete... Endoscope evaluation of a colon is indicated once a patient presents with um, erectile bleed, and uh, will I'll outline some of the some of the um, uh, presentations of the colon just briefly, so that we can know which side presents with the bleed, and which side presents with the occult bleed. So then the, the, the differential diagnosis of a PR bleeding can be colorectal cancer, like I've said, IBD inflammatory bowel disease, colitis, diverticular disease, and angiodysplasia. So when, when once a patient presents with this, then you, you, you then have to think about this. Obviously, patient would also present with anal fissure, which is what I'm going to discuss in depth. Uh, hemorrhoids is what I'm going to discuss also in depth. So the indication for complete colon evaluation. So the patients that you really need to go and evaluate the whole colon, should they present 
with a bleed. So which are those patients? You see a patient above age of 40 with no complete examination within the previous 10 years. So, so this is actually taken also from the Amsterdam, which talks about three, two, one, and it talks about the age, but I think the age is now dropping to about 45 on the latest one that is reviewed. And then you also have a 40 year old or a 10 year younger than the age of a diagnosed with a history of a, posi of a positive for a single, first degree or relative of a colorectal cancer advanced adeno diagnosed as less than 60. So somebody who's 40 has a risk of a family member, first degree. So 10 years younger than the diagnosed of the index case, then you have to complete evaluate as well. Or somebody who had the diagnosis or who had a, a, an adenoma, adenoma at the less than age of 60. So then as well, the 40 year old or 10 year younger than the age of diagnosis with a history of a positive of two first degree relative with advanced adenomas or colorectal cancer. And then there's also patients with a positive fecal um, um, uh, immunochemical testing and then uh, a fecal occult um, DNA testing. So then let's, let's outline this before we get too far. The left colon would usually present with a bleed parietal bleeding, but the right colon usually present with what we call an occult bleed because then the affluent on the right colon is still fluidy. So when the patient is bleeding, you have the blood mixed with what is going to be stools later when we absorb water. So one cannot appreciate the bleeding. So that is why the patients who present with the right colon cancer do usually present with anemia, which has no known cause. So before you have a threshold of just transfusing them, investigate. So one of the things that you want is to do is to do an upper scope and a lower scope just to interrogate the whole colon. In most cases, for patients who have been having anemia of unknown cause, it will actually be a iron deficiency anemia on investigation. So therefore one would then need to investigate where they're losing blood. And most of these cases, people are just transfusing them and everything without actually worrying that they might be missing a lesion that is in the right colon. And the lesions that are in the right colon, while I'm at that, they are peculiar of having being a, a polypoid than circumferential. So meaning they will present with um, bowel obstruction or, or they will, by the time they present, they are well advanced. So you have a patient who has a well advanced disease at the presentation, but the ones on the left, those are the ones that are circumferential, the lesions are circumferential and they can give you a PR bleed. The, the difference between your PR bleed of a carcinoma and somehow of a diverticular disease, the diverticular disease is some, somewhat a purplish, um, dark red color of a bleed on a patient like that. So, they, they, so, so that's in broad how to differentiate between the two. And obviously the, right, the, the, the left colon would give you a bowel obstruction quite early while the right colon won't give you a bowel obstruction. You just have an anemia that you don't know any, that you don't know where it comes from. And therefore those patients need to be sent for an evaluation of a complete colon. Or if you are able to do that where you're practicing, they need to be evaluated. And then now the clinical presentation can be a painful and painless PR bleeding, but there are worrisome signs and I've already dealt with anemia. When somebody comes with a weight loss, and then they have blood when they when they when they when they are when they are defecating. Patient that feels like they went to the toilet and then they, but they feel like the rectum is not empty. Those are the patients that sh you should be worried about. They need to be investigated further, and those patients need to be referred if you can't. And another thing is that on the anatomy of the rectum, you realize that the rectum is about fifteen centimeters. Um, in itself and added to the anal canal, which, which is different between males and females, you, you are actually by virtue able to, to do a parietal examination that is, that is to the middle rectum. So the rest of the rectum cannot be um, uh, uh, examined completely with a digital examination. So the cancers that are higher up in the rectum one might miss them and patient still has a, has a PR bleed. So those patients, so even if you did a PR and there's nothing on PR, some of those patients that have worrisome signs needs to be investigated. And then that, that is when you have an indication to evaluate the whole colon. 
Again, so when you examine these patients, you need to make sure that you check J cold. I mean, when you examine them, J cold that we're taught in the undergrad, it still works. It's still wonderful. They, there are people who are still um, advocating and teaching us, and it's a it's a good tool to use because when you examine this patient, don't forget to do a PR examination, abdominal examination, because you can pick up a mess, and then you know um, why the patient is having a PR bleeding. Check lymphadenopathy. We've discussed that the, 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 the patients who have a lower rectal tumors and anal tumors, they, they, they will also drain into the inguinal um, lymph nodes, which needs to be examined. And then if any suspicion, then one can, in, can investigate further. Also patient that comes and says that I've got PR bleeding, but they've got shortness of breath. They might have a metastatic disease. Check if they've got a palpable liver, sorry, um, a misspell, and then ascites as well. Some of them will present with jaundice. So management of those patients is a quite a big topic for me to go into, but, but management will depend on the stages of that. But those patients, those are not patients that you just transfuse and send them home. The age, when somebody comes with constipation or they have a change in bowel habits and they are of an older age, you must have a threshold to worry that you investigate the whole colon. Somebody has a positive history of a colorectal cancer, you must also worry. There are syndromes that they, they present in other first degrees as other cancers, like, uh, like uh, that, that one would make you think that I need to worry about the, the, the risk of it being colorectal. So, so the, the management is quite broad. So I'm just gonna leave it at, at, at the fact that it's, it's, it's then managed according to the staging and that should be referred to a surgeon. Okay, so let's talk about hemorrhoids as giving you a PR bleeding. So usually the patients who have hemorrhoids, they've got this history that they they see blood after passing stools in the in the in the in the toilet itself and everything. Most of them are painless bleed. So they just have the painless bleed and they see a lot of blood that is squitting and is is spitting. So now we know that we have three cushions and you have usually hemorrhoids at three, seven o'clock and 11 o'clock. So if you, if, you, if you check, it's actually based on the blood supply uh, that one has because on the left is two anterior and lateral and then on the right is posterior located uh, vessels, which then would then give you the, the hemorrhoids. So the hemorrhoids are defined as a, as a, as a uh, as a symptomatic enlargement of distal displacement of uh, anal cushions. Remember this word, anal cushions, would then when you treat them, you must remember that now you are gonna be taking the cushion and therefore the complications of it, um, it's not just a benign um, procedure. And actually some colorectal surgeons would advocate for not touching them um, as well. So, so the issue is that the, the anal cushions uh, when engorged with blood, they maintain anal continence during coughing and straining. So that means taking them out, you will have the complications of incontinence on patients. They protect underlying anal sphincter during defecation. They play a key role in differentiating liquid, solid, and gas in decision to evacuate. So as much as they could be disturbing your patients, as much as there could be a problem, you, when you remove them, you must remember its function because you're taking that function away. Pathophysiology, the exact pathomechanism is poorly understood, but most widely accepted theory is a sliding anal canal. Hemorrhoids developed due to deterioration of anal cushions supporting the tissue. Muscle tissues replaced by collagen fibers that is on a microscopic level. So, but now the American Society of Colorectal and uh, of Colon and Rectal Surgeons, the evaluation of hemorrhoids, the disease-specific history and physical examination should be, should be performed, emphasize the degree and the duration of symptoms and the risk factors. Most of this, these patients would then tell you that they strain when they go to the toilet. So most of them, they have this, this training that they have, and that is why each time they go to the toilet, they bleed and stuff so one must elicit that and obviously the first point of contact in terms of alleviating the symptoms of constipation is one is to look at the diet and then once the diet is in you we, we advocate for high fire but taking a lot of water so that we can then have them not um, um, um bleeding all the time but one 
needs to know that is a pain, pain painless rectal bleed. Uh, you, we, I think I've said that based on the the anatomy as well, um, because I, I believe surgery is an applied anatomy. So ask about the extent, severity, duration of symptoms, the bleeding, and the prolapse. So some patients would come with a prolapse. What do you think is a prolapsed um, um, uh, hemorrhoid? Can they actually have a complete rectal prolapse? So one needs to be asked asking about that. The issues of perianal hygiene, the presence and the absence of pain, which we did. The fecal incontinence symptoms, if um, the patient has that. So physical examination, you need to visualize and, and inspect the anus, also look at the integrity. So also you need to examine them in different positions to be able to exclude any prolapse or any full thickness um, rectal prolapse. You might need to do or have an inoscope to have a look. At some, at some point, the, the lower grades, when you put in a finger to do a perectal examination, you might not be able to appreciate the, the extent. So therefore one needs to, um, might need to put an inoscope. Actually, it's advocated to put an inoscope so that you can be able to, to tell the degrees. And these are the degrees we have in terms of the hemorrhoids. And usually our patients presented grade three and grade four. Some that presented in grade two, some is just because the, the discomfort that comes with, 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 the, with them when they, they, some of them when they're thrombosed, then they present as that. And obviously management of them will depend on the grading. First line, I've already alluded, and I've uh, spoken about that, that they must avoid straining, um, limit, limiting the time on the toilet, and then one needs to get them on um, adequate fluid and fiber. These um, um, flibotonics, they, 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 they are you know, postulated to work, but, but the mechanism of action are not uh, fully understood. Associated with the strengthening of a blood vessel wall, increased venous tone, lymphatic drainage, and normalizing capillary permeability as well, so that they can be able to, to, to drain and not be engorged. And then there's office treatment that one can do. Grade one, grade two, uh, patients who have failed medical treatment. So most of these patients, when once we put them on, 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 on medication that they, they now have a regular stools as well. Some, you know, we, 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 we put them on sherry proct, put them on anusol and see if it doesn't, um, um, you know, uh, work in terms of decreasing that. But then once they, they fail, um, the, the, the goal is then to alleviate the symptoms by decreasing the size of a hemorrhoidal tissue and increase the fixation of hemorrhoidal tissue to a rectal wall to minimize the prolapse. Procedure is really, usually well tolerated with minimal pain and discomfort and may require repeated applications as well. So you will see that there are many modalities that one can do from rubber band ligation, which is um, which which can be done, you know, in 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 the office, you know, uh, for some it's most popular and effective way. You don't have to take the patient, you know, um, uh, to to theater as well. And then there's ligation of a hemorrhoidal tissue, ischemia, and the causes of a prolapse mucosa followed by scar fixation to the rectal wall. Ligation performed uh, well above the dentate line where the somatic sensation is absent. So if you apply this quite lower, the patients will have excruciating pain and, 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 and a lot of discomfort. Um, contraindication patients on anticoagulation as well. Sclerotherapy uh, can be done from grade one to grade three of those patients that present with um, um, uh, parietal bleed due to hemorrhoids. Most commonly used sclerosis as hemorrhoidal tissues and phenol and in almond or veg, uh, veg oil or sodium tetradecyl sulfate, uh, those there that, uh, that are being used. And the um, mechanism of action, the fibrosis of a submucosa with fixation of hemorrhoidal tissue, the technique, uh, the submucosal injection at the apex of the hemorrhoidal bundle at about two mils of 1% sodium tetradecyl sulfate or one to three mils of 5% phenol in oil. Complications, because of laceration, necrosis, prostatic abscess, retroperitoneal sepsis. So here you, you, you understand that 
the 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 you say that there isn't um, any alcohol that is used because it's mostly uh, dangerous. These complications are mostly seen when when one uses alcohol. But these with these you can still have those complications when you use a fluorescent. And there was inf infrared coagulation that can be used for grade one and grade two. The direct application on infrared waves resulting in a protein necrosis within the hemorrhoid. That can also work. The, 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 the major complications are rare when you want, one is working in the office, but the perianal sepsis, sepsis life-threatening, urinary dysfunction, worsening pain, fever, initial perianal sepsis. So the rubber band ligation, can also um, cause bleeding uh, due to the um, the ulcer formation as well, and they can cause significant pain if misplaced or they are low or near the dentate line, and they will require removal. I think I've already talked about that. Thrombosed external hemorrhoids, excision of a, a hemorrhoid may result into more rapid symptom resolve lower incident of recurrent and longer remission intervals compared to an observation um, management. So most of the patients that present with uh, thrombosis, they will present, present with pain of external. That's when you just um, localize them, cut in and, and expel the, the clot that is causing the tension in the tissue, so therefore causing pain. And then the patients resolve um, quite quicker. Surgical management, surgical excision. Remember, um, when we spoke about surgical excision is that they are the cushions, they help you to maintain continence. So if one is going to embark on the excision, one needs to take one or two at most at the time, not all of them. Because now complications of that, of excision, one, would have a stenosis later due to a scar tissue formation. And then that will have a patient having a anal stenosis and therefore needing multiple dilatations, which is, which is also gonna cause them pain. So one needs to be able to do them uh, in stages if one has to embark on them. And the indications thereof would then be if a patient is bleeding and the bleeding is not controlled, they're not being reduced, they're prolapsed and they're sitting there as well. The thrombosed, um, as well, but most of it indication one would go with bleeding, but also the 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 excision itself. There are different modalities that one can use, but bleeding is at the top of the list of the complications of after performing a surgical excision of the hemorrhoid. Right, so they say the grade three and grade four hemorrhoids, substantial skin tags fail or cannot tolerate office based procedures. And these are the ones that you obviously do in theater where you have a proper lighting, you have a proper um, uh, controlled environment in terms of you also having to um, control the bleeding. Closed procedure associated with decreased post operative pain, fast wound healing, and less risk of post op bleeding. Okay, so there's what we call staple hemorrhoidectomy. Um, that is being performed. It's quite a, it's quite a good instrument to use, um, but should the instrument fail to clip and suture, you will have an open wound that the patient is bleeding from and really profusely bleeding. Um, as surgeons, we don't mind blood, but once the patient starts bleeding from their failure of a stapler, you, you, you won't like it. So um, excising the circumferential ring of a mucosa four centimeter above the dentate line using a circular stapler and interrupted superior mesenteric vessels and, re and restores the hemorrhoidal tissue back to their anatomical position. Prolapsing hemorrhoid firstly reduced and then pestringed suture with two um, proline and placed two to three centimeter above the dentate line and uh, catching all the mucosa and the submucosa. Okay, so how um, this is done, this is now an open procedure, which we call um, Milligan Morgan. Um, the patient is in lithotomy position, prone, clean, draped area, inject local anesthesia, and then um, uh, pl uh, place a heel, figures, and retractor. Um, as well, some you can you can also use pack speculum. So, and you grasp hemorrhoidal tissue covered by skin with a uh, Kelly clamps and prolapse the hemorrhoid tissue 
and the rectal mucosa superior to hemorrhoidal um, uh, visible and ligated vascular pedicle with a vicral 2.0 and, and, and leave the wound open. So the Milligan Morgan, you just ligate, you just control the bleed, you just control the vessel, and then later you, you just leave the wound open. And then, but we have um, Ferguson, which is a closed um, procedure. So you do the same thing as well, but the difference is that here with uh, Ferguson, you then close. So you will then do a continuous wound closure uh, from the beginning at the apex of the wound and coming down, suturing towards yourself. And then you you also take small bites of intersfictal included uh, in a closure to decrease the dead space. So you don't just close, uh, you also uh, obliterate the dead space um, as well. And then with these patients, you, one needs to be um, meticulous in terms of when you excise the tissue, because you have seen on the anatomy that the plague, there's a plexus that tends to bleed when one excise. So bleeding, bleeding, bleeding should be taken care of. But you will realize that if you then start by closing the pedicle distally, like they do in the Milligan Morgan, you are going to, you know, um, close, you, you're going to be able to switch out quite comfortably while there's in a lot of bleed that is now um, in your felt. And then there is a Doppler guided hemorrhoid ligation that uses an inoscope with a Doppler probe to identify hemorrhoidal artery, and then you ligate it. Um, this lacks a tissue excision and decreased pain, but the limitation is in terms of the cost. And also the, 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 the um, you know, it, it's a delayed gratification as well, because then, then the, the tissue won't just at that point shrink because you're not excising the tissue. The complications, are quite um, quite long um, with uh, with uh, with um, um, the the surgical management, but you have two one to two percent who have a post op hemorrhaging, and then you also have about a high percentage of urinary retention as a complication. Now, let's talk about. Anal fissures is one of the causes as well of parietal bleeding. So the anal fissures are a cut usually um, at six o'clock in most cases um, on the on the anal canal. And the fissures, in contrast to the internal hemorrhoids, they're quite painful. And the pain in anal fissures are caused by two things. They firstly are caused by the spasm of the sphincters, which then says you have a wound that is ischemic. So you have an ischemic pain and a somatic pain itself due to the cut that you have. So what are the risk factors of somebody having an anal fissure again on somebody has constipation and then when they push or some people who also um, prefer sticking things up the rectum or the people who have anal receptive um, um, intercourse as well. So they, it's a tear in essence. And the tear would then present as a bleeding that mostly they see when they wipe. And some would gen see it sometimes on the side, on the steric side of, of the feces when it's passed. So it's different from the bleed of hemorrhoids. It does not squirt or spit. It's a bleed that one sees when they wipe to see that they, they have a cut, right? So it's a longitudinal tear or defect in the epithelium of the anal canal extending from a dented light towards the anal veg. And that is where you have a somatic innervation. That's why they're painful. So the pain, severe pain and bleeding during and after the bowel movement, they can have a chronic and, and, um, and uh, acute so that depends only on the duration. So acute fissure appears to be simple longitudinal epileptic, uh, uh, elliptic, uh, septation with an inoderm. Chronic are characterized by edema, fibrosis, expelled internal anal sphincter fiber, sentinel pale that we, you know, some will come with what, what looks like a skin tag. So that will tell you that this is, is being 
there for long. So when you examine patients like that, those are patients that you want to alleviate them um, from that because they've had that for quite long. And then they have hypertrophy of the anal papilla at the proximal fissure margin. Okay, so you can appreciate their picture there. And you actually have a sentinel pile there. So some of them would present to you and say, no, I've got piles and then they swollen and painful and everything. But when you examine them, this patient would not let you examine them in the rooms. So even if you try, it's so uncomfortable that it might not, the examination might not benefit you much. So some of this patient, one might just need to take them to theater and then also exclude other things that could cause pain on PR. And one of the stuff that you can miss that cause pain on PR is perianal abscess, which is devastating if you miss it because they, those patients present with anal pain, severe anal pain, and you wouldn't be able to appreciate the examination. So the best thing is that this patient, when you see that you're not weaning, if you're treating them as a general practitioner where, practitioner where you are, send them and let's have a look at them. Let's exclude other things and let's help you heal this patient. They are quite, uh, the chronic or acute, it's quite uh, corrected. Acute, you have symptoms that are less than eight weeks and, and often heals completely with conservative therapy within four to eight weeks. Chronic fissure symptoms are more than eight weeks and heals incompletely and recares. Surgery may be required to repair a chronic fissure. So these ones will recare and everything um, as well. Uh, primary um, is often related to local anal trauma without any significant underlying disease process. Solitary and located in a midline position, like I said, at six o'clock in most cases, that's what you find. Much more common than secondary fish. Secondary fish associated with other underlying disease process, okay, in a typical location can be multiple secondary fish, less than 1% are lateral or multiple. Most of them is just single one at six o'clock in the midline. Typical fissures, morphology is usually simple, superficial tear in the inoderm, usually located in a posterior or anterior midline, not associated with any other pro, um, processes. A typical, unusual, variable morph uh, morphology, deeper, wider tear in inoderm can occur in any position and then tends to be associated with other disease processes like TB, Crohn's, HIV. Okay? That is a grading of the and um, anal fissures, fissure in any, you, 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 if you like. And then um, this is where to grade three, where there is a visible internal um, sphincter with fibrosis. And then um, the goal is to promote healing, minimize symptoms, prevent recurrence and complication. General management principle, um, break the cycle of pain and internal sphincter spasm to improve blood flow to promote healing. So. Just to make it clear, so here with this patient, the fact that they're sitting at the spasm is causing them pain. The fact that they have a cut is causing them pain. So when you manage them, you also need to, to you need to manage how to increase the blood flow to the wound so that you can promote healing and also how to decrease the somatic pain. And that is how you, you manage that when it's a simple acute that can be managed uh, conservatively. And the diagnosis is based obviously on the history, visible inspection and examination. Avoid PR in this patient with anal fissure because they, they, they quite have pain. So treatment conservative plus topical medication. Second line, you have uh, botulinum toxin injection um, into an internal anal sphincter. I, I can tell you in my later experience, Humbly, so I've never seen somebody inject this. So um, I've got no experience in that. I've never even seen it where I trained. Um, lateral internal sphincterotomy, it's a gold standard management of anal fissure. And then major complication is incontinence. So let's talk about the topical. So in most cases, like I said, you need to deal with the pain, somatic pain. You also need to deal with ischemic pain. So um, we, we, we use the local anesthetic like Remicane gel, one can use that. And then you can also use calcium channel blockers. We used to use the other like before they faced it out. So you can use um, AMLO, AMLOC as well. So to have that increased blood flow so that the wound can heal and also local so that they stop being into spasm. Because what then creates a problem is that they start having a ischemic pain and somatic pain.
and then they cannot differentiate they'll just tell you they have pain right and then the the we said that the chronic ones are the ones that one would um you know um readily want to take them to theater so that you can treat that surgically and then um those are the ones that we use lateral internal sphincterotomy so what it means that they're in theater draped clean in the thotomy position you palpate the internal anal sphincter and then some will talk about taking 50 percent and some will talk about take, taking the whole of it the difference in that in 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 um, in, uh, in the benefit well i can't tell you i, I don't know but what how i was trained is that you, you you can take all the internal sphincter so what happens the difference again just to recap the difference between internal and external sphincter is that internal it's involuntary the external is voluntary so external is striated as skeletal muscle so you want to take the involuntary one so that they can they don't sit in spasm even if because they, they they don't sit in spasm because they want to they sit in spasm because of the pain so you take the internal sphincter and then it will then relax the inoderm, it will really relax the anal canal, and then the blood flow will increase towards that, and they will heal. But you need to tell your patients. I, I believe, as as um, as young, as young as I am in the field, um, newly qualified, I I believe that we need to be honest with our patients. You know, when you're honest and educate them, take your time. Are you still there, Doc? We seem to have lost you, Dr. Kekana. Are you still there? Okay. Um, oh. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I, yeah. I, I need permission to unmute myself. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I don't know why you, you can't unmute yourself. We'll sort it out soon. Yeah, but go ahead. We can hear you. Yes, I'm still here. It's just that this thing um, wants me to unmute myself a couple of times. I'm still here. Okay. I'm saying um, I'm here. I'm here, Doc. Um, I can I can take I can take questions uh, if there's any questions on the floor. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for, for, for this detailed presentation. Yeah, Great. I'm saying I am uh, I am done. I can take um questions. Yeah, no, that's fine. The floor, if there's any questions on the floor. Yeah, there's I think I've seen one question already. Uh, Dr. Nevondo's hand is up whilst I'm still looking for a question. Uh, Dr. Nevondo, go ahead, please. Okay. Or it was, I don't know if you're mute. Oh, get ahead. Yeah, yeah. If, if you unmuted yourself. Go ahead, Doc. Unmute yourself again. Dr. Nevondo, unmute yourself. Okay. I think I unmuted. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, sure. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I was saying thanks for the for a lovely presentation. Uh even a I think he might be video. struggling to unmute himself too. Uh, okay, let's can you let hear Dr. me? Nevoda speak, Dr. Kigana. You will, you will respond. Yeah. yeah, we can hear you very well. Go ahead. Okay, I was saying uh, thanks for a lovely presentation to Dr. Kigana. It it actually makes sense even to an orthopod, just on some of the things that you meet because sometimes you even meet a patient who come with an injury or a fracture of a bone, but for one reason or another they tell you about their rectal bleeding, and it's good to know that there are a few things that one can do and there people that you can safely refer to. So my one question is, can you ever have a patient with both an anal fissure and uh, hemorrhoids? And, if, and from a surgical point of view, I 
I muted myself. So Dr. Kana, can you respond? Patients, uh, can they present with anal fissures and hemorrhoids at the same time? Okay, I think uh, your connection was not that clean there. You're saying, can you have somebody with anal fissure and, uh, and him? Yeah. And the yeah, hemorrhoids at the same time, yes, yeah. Okay, so like I said, um, what they, they call a hemorrhoid, it is actually the sentinel pile from a chronic fissure that the patient has. So if you take a detailed history, you'll, you'll, you'll then hear that the patient has been having that fissure for long. So now we said that the, we, yeah. So we, we, said that, we said that the patient with chronic fissures, they present with the fissure itself. And then what do we call a sentinel pile? It's a sentinel hemorrhoid, but those are not actually the, those are not the hemorrhoid, typical hemorrhoid. It's actually a sentinel pile. So, you know, you never say never, but I have never seen a patient who present with both. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, th thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for the response. Here's another question. Um, how effective, Dr. Desai, how effective is manual reduction? Um, can you still hear me? I also see there's a question from uh, Dr. Desai, yes. Dr. Desai. who is saying, do GPs have to refer every PR bleeding? When the PR is negative, yeah. Yeah, do they have to refer every PR bleeding when the PR is negative? Yeah, I think we, yeah. Yes, Dr. Kikana. Okay. Um, I can see I can see the question in the box. I think your 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 network is is it? Yeah. So let's start, let's start with okay. Okay, so I think um uh, yeah, I'm here. I think Dr. Totezi, um yes, you have to. Because the reason is that your PR does not interrogate the whole rectum. So your PR goes, I'm sure your finger should be about eight to nine centimeters at most. The rectum is 15 centimeters. So even if, they, even if the PR is negative, you can still have a patient who has diverticular bleed, can have a patient who has ulcerative colitis, can have a patient who still has a malignancy. So yes, any PR bleeding should be interrogated further. You have a reason to refer because by the time you feel something, it is already late. So some of you, if, you, if you'd have an inoscope or proctoscope, or actually proctoscope, it gives you much more vision compared to your PR examination, which PR examination is not adequate enough. So yes, you must refer. And then decide said how effective is manual reduction and chances of recurrence in hemorrhoids. So for me, when you say manual reduction, you mean just reducing the hemorrhoid. And when you reduce, that means you put it back inside. But remember that there are different grades of hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids that are prolapsed and are irreducible, grade four. Grade three, you can reduce them, they come back again. Grade two, they are reducible and they stay there. Grade one, they do not prolapse. You'll possibly not going to see them unless if you do an inoscope. And I hope that answers your question. So, so your, your manual reduction has a place in grade two, but grade three, you will reduce, they will prolapse again. So you are actually not doing anything. You, you are treating yourself. Okay, thanks for that. I hope you can hear me, Dr. Gekana. Uh, um, and I see there's a question from... Is um, Dr. Malawzi, yes, Malawzi. Yeah, Malawzi. Um, yeah, I can go ahead and answer that question. So yeah, it says, it? sorry if I don't call you by your titles because they're not written here, no disrespect. Um, because no, I don't know um, <laughs> your, your titles. I'm sorry about that. Um, Yeah. 
yeah, the, the question is, is fissurectomy the mainstay treatment of anal fissure? And yeah. if not, um, well, what I is see, it? Uh, thank you very much. Um, says fissurectomy, is fissurectomy the main treatment of anal fissure? If not, so when is it indicated? Okay. Um, you actually, yeah. Okay, so I've, I've, I can tell you that part. I've never seen somebody do what we call physiotherapy. It's actually the first time that I hear of that definition to quite tell you the truth. Um, so how you treat a fissure, surgical intervention for fissure, it's internal, lateral internal sphincterotomy and the fissure heals for itself. Remember, if you remove that fissure, you are just deepening the wound that needs a blood supply to heal. And that area is quite painful for you to be doing any work there. So I don't remember having heard of fissurectomy, to tell you the truth. So I, I wouldn't tell you when is it indicated. So therefore, I've never heard of that. So surgical management of that, of a chronic, acute, conservative, chronic, surgical, which the, the, the procedure would be internal lateral sphincterotomy in theater. Okay. Okay, thank you, and It looks like we the are other question to is, to as surgeon, uh, I will do, why forget medical causes of erectile bleed? Yes, thank you. Thank you for that question. I think you're answering uh, Dr. Totezi. So another question from Fatima says, how effective is the lot stretch? I cannot tell you how effective it is, but I've seen quite. Okay, there's a there's a last question that I can respond to. Um, the lot stretch, I see they're saying how effective is the lot stretch. I've seen few people who does that. I don't know how much it advocated. I've never read any literature that advocates a lot stretch because effectively, what was what what. The intention is to tear the sphincter, and how you know to to what extent? I I've I've no experience in terms of the the lot stretch. Quite very very few people that I've had them practicing lot stretch, and so therefore I cannot I cannot tell you I didn't read any literature that um, that advocates that uh, it's superior or inferior to our conventional um, treatment. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Doc. There's a hand. Uh, it looks like your bandway, bandway uh, with it's it's a bit I slow. I don't see any question so in, the, in the chat box. Uh, no, no, they they don't. Oh, Bulelo, any hands that Bulelo is raised? Um, so right. I think um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, that's my time. Takes a while um, to hear. Let me hello, hello, Doc. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a, a nice presentation. Uh, from the anesthetic point of view, yeah. if we have these patients on the table, especially the one for hemorrhoids, do you do you advocate or do you advise if if I ask you to inject a marking with adrenaline before you you cut? And uh, what 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 do you, what is your take on that? You are muted, Dr. Kekan. You are muted. If you can unmute yourself. No, he's not muted, Doc. His bandwidth is slow. So oh, we okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you uh, very much, Dr. Gobbs. Um, yes, yes, you do. Um, I think I said it that you inject the local anesthetic there. So yes, it is. Um, Yeah, so I'm sorry about the slowness of the connection. Um, yeah, I'm saying, uh, Dr. Gobile, it is it is advocated to inject the um, to inject the local anesthetic um, there before you start waking. Um, but as for the 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 effectivity in terms of the bleeding, 
the most effective way is to is to work on the pedicle before you start cutting any hemorrhoidal tissue and use a cautery. That's how much you can minimize the bleeding. But yes, it is advocated as a direct answer to your question. Thank you very much, Dr. Kikana. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, I think we're battling with our bandwidth with Dr. Kikana this evening. I hope you can still hear me, Doc. Um, I'm going to take, because we don't have any more questions, and I think in the, in the, due to the fact that we are, we have network problems this evening, uh, we'll, we'll stop the discussion here. But I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Enes Kenosh, our Chief of Operations, uh, just to make a last few remarks before we go for a closure. Dr. Kenosh? Okay. Uh, Good, good, good evening, Dr. Bila, and good, good evening to all our guests this evening. A special um, greetings to our speaker tonight, Dr. Kikana. Um, thank you very much for a very, I think, a very lucidly and eloquently delivered uh, talk on rectal bleeding, a very common uh, problem uh, in, the, in surgery, but in general practice, as well, and uh, I think you've put it so well uh, for all of us, uh, um, especially those who qualified maybe long ago or those who are not in surgery itself, uh, who had a, an opportunity to do a revision of our knowledge. I think um, it's people like you who are prepared to come up uh, and um, and educate us on the latest in the management of these conditions that keep us um, up to date with our knowledge. And we really appreciate it, um, Dr. Kikana. Um, and uh, I think uh, you will continue to do well, hopefully in your practice. And um, we encourage other surgeons, other physicians, uh, obstetricians, and, uh, uh, and other specialists on, on the line tonight to come up, those who would like to talk on any topic of interest uh, to our, um, our practitioners, uh, both in government and in private sector. Uh, I think uh, clinics put this uh, webinars together in 2020 uh, during COVID time, and uh, we couldn't do contact um, uh, uh, CPD events uh, during that time and we went this way and uh, it's quite popular. We could see today there were over 200, well over 200 uh, participants tonight, um, Dr. Kikana, who logged in to listen to you. And um, as long as we in clinics appreciate all of you who managed to log in, but as long as you continue to log in, we will continue to provide this service every Thursday hosted by um, uh, Dr. Bila, uh, who is our webinar master, uh, who is actually uh, do, uh, doing very well every Thursday. Uh, we, if you have registered properly and in, and and put in your CP, your your HPCA, SPCSA number when you register, you will automatically your CPD points that you'll gain tonight will will automatically be. Uh, recognized by the HPCSA, so our, our, our IT and marketing team uh, have connected to HPCSA systems so that as you register, you automatically get CPD points and they will be emailed to you. So you should receive an email within a week. If you don't receive an email that credits your CPD points for today, uh, within the next two weeks, please contact uh, Dr. Bila or, or myself and we will uh, uh, correct it. Um, we also thank, of course, our IT um, um, a team in the background, Camo, uh, uh, who's uh, been helping in the background today. We apologize for the snacks, uh, the, uh, the IT snacks that we had today, uh, but um, we all learn from them. I think the message of Dr. Kikana still managed to get through, and we really appreciate it. I think I'll hand over to you, Dr. Bila, to, to Close the session. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Kenoshi, for, uh, for those kind words to Dr. Kikan and to all participants. And it's a pleasure to have you always uh, joining us for the webinars and uh, the clinics executive for allowing us to have the space for the last two and a half years or so. 
And colleagues, thank you very much for logging in tonight. And we really appreciate you for, for taking your time. And as Dr. Kinoshe said, please do indicate if you want to do a presentation, we'll gladly accommodate you. And for those that we were not able to answer your questions due to time factor, uh, please don't hesitate to send them to myself uh, or, or to Phoenix at webinars. And we will gladly forward the questions to Dr. Kekena, who will respond to you. And we look forward to seeing you again, not next week, but the week after, because next week we want to let you have time to prepare and celebrate uh, your, your day on June 16th, Friday, the following day. Thank you very much and have a good evening.